Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the, the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about obsession, which I'm going to insist on saying that way. Um, so that it sounds either like a perfume line or a strip club, whatever uh, you prefer, whatever you associate with that. Um, but in Obsession, basically, uh, Kirk is down on the planet with some dudes and he's like, oh, I smell this crazy smell that I smelled 11 years ago when this gaseous entity attacked the USS Farragut and killed half the crew, including the captain who was my BFF at the time. Um, and so Kirk becomes obsessed with finding this creature and destroying it. He's convinced that it's a creature rather than just a natural phenomenon, because as it was attacking him 11 years ago, he sensed an intelligence, which is exactly how we determine whether or not something is alive, apparently. Um, but basically, Kirk works a lot off of intuition in this episode. He keeps coming back to this idea of, I know this isn't rational, but my intuition says, and my uh, command prerogative recognizes intuition as a legitimate reason for doing something. So they are going after this creature, which is quite literally Kirk's white whale. It is a white gaseous entity capable of traveling through space um, that sucks the red corpuscles out of human beings, thereby killing them. Um, we also have Ensign Garvik, um, who Kirk sort of puts in charge of the security force that goes down to the planet to try and find this entity initially. Um, Garvik was the, is the son of the former captain of the Farragut who died 11 years earlier. Um, the gaseous entity appears Garvik's like, oh, I'm startled. Now I'm blasting with my phaser. Oh no, two guys have died. At which point, Kirk is like, you have failed. Go to your room, basically. Like, he relieves him of, of his duties, and he confines him to quarters. What we find out through Kirk and, or through um, Spock and McCoy's sort of investigations is that 11 years earlier on the Farragut, Kirk had momentarily hesitated, had not shot at the creature as soon as he saw it, and then he blames himself for the death of half the crew and Captain Garvik. What they come to find out, especially when they pursue this entity into space and start blasting it with the ship's phasers and photon torpedoes, is that it does not care about phasers. Like, it is not at all concerned about being blasted with the ship's phasers. And so, the idea 
that Kirk and Garvik both get into their heads that if they had just shot it quickly enough, it would have been destroyed, is completely blown out of the water. Nonetheless, um, Spock becomes convinced that they have to kill this entity as well. Um, and so they sort of, there's a battle between them. Um, the entity basically invades the ship, um, gets trapped sort of in the vent system, but then it manages to come through one of the vents. Uh, Spock is able to like stop it basically because he, his, his blood is based on copper and not on iron the way that human blood is. And so the creature's like, hmm, don't like this. I'm a piece out now. So it, so they end up tracking it back to its home planet. And basically they're like, well, let's just blow up half of this planet with an antimatter explosion. Uh, so they end up doing that. And that's the resolution of it. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. One, uh, one element very obviously um, I think is is just introduced by the title of this episode. Because again, you have this Moby Dick ripoff to the of the of the in this episode, basically, right? This idea of I will do whatever I have to do to pursue this goal. I am single minded about the pursuit of this entity to the exclusion of all other considerations, up to the point where McCoy and Spock are like on the verge of filing a medical report that Kirk is not fit for command because of the decisions he's making. Now, part of the component of that is that they're supposed to be rendezvousing with the, U uh, with the USS Yorktown and picking up some badly needed medicine to go to, um, I don't know, a plagued planet or something like this. Um, and the medicine has a very limited shelf life. So they need to go and get this medicine and deliver it. Otherwise, it will not work. And, Sp and Kirk is putting off doing that to pursue this entity. And so there become these sort of questions about, is he fit for command is his judgment sound regarding this entity. So that's one element of it. Um, this question of single-minded devotion to a particular goal, even as it ha even as that obsession has detrimental effects on those around you. Because a number of crew people do die. I mean, this, we have those direct deaths, but there's also that element of, I am ignoring the need for this medicine, which has a very, very limited time frame for delivery um, in pursuit of this entity. So that willingness to allow others to die, to allow this plague on this planet to go unchecked, in pursuit of this creature, um, that's a major, major element. That's a major, major problem with human psychology. The the psychology of obsession, and that time I'm just saying the word, I'm not saying the episode title, um, but the psychology of obsession is incredibly problematic and incredibly dangerous because it clouds the ability to think rationally and to weigh competing interests. So that's one element of this. Another element of this is quite honestly genocide. I mean, this is a creature that exists in the universe. It apparently has a home planet. They track it to what they at least think is its home planet. Um, Spock believes it's going there to spawn. Not really clear on what evidence he makes that assumption, or, or at least I don't remember on what evidence he makes that assumption, but basically they, they decide that if it's there to spawn, and there's going to be thousands of them, because Spock decides that as well, um, then we have to destroy it. So they blow up half of this planet with an antimatter explosion, presumably 
destroying the creature, although I don't know that they really check to sort of make sure. They just sort of assume, well, half the planet's gone. The creature's probably done for. That is, not to put too fine a point on it, genocide. Right? I mean, if this is the only creature of its kind in existence, and you have determined to destroy it, that would fit the definition of genocide. And they, in fact, destroy half of a planet in the attempt to wipe this species from existence in the universe. Quite problematic. Yes, it poses a threat to human life because it consumes red corpuscles, it eats iron-based hemoglobin or whatever it is. Sure, I accept that. It is nonetheless genocidal to say because of this, because it poses this threat, we are entitled to destroy the only being of its kind in the galaxy. And this is actually a problem that they have come up against before, particularly in an episode like The Devil in the Dark. They are dealing with the last Horta. And Kirk Spock and the crew make the case to these miners who want to kill the last Horta on this planet that they don't have the right to commit genocide, essentially. They don't have the right to destroy this entire species, the last one of its kind, because it has killed some of their miners. It's interesting that in this episode, in Obsession, we don't get that discussion at all. Because Kirk is convinced that this creature is dangerous and must be destroyed, because it kills members of their crew, because it invades the ship, all for all of these reasons, nobody really makes the case, This is, if this is an intelligent entity that exists in the universe, perhaps it has a right to exist, and we do not have the right to destroy it. So it is interesting that, unlike in Devil in the Dark with the Horta, here we don't have that consideration at all. They are very, very willing to accept the destruction of this species as a good thing. 